Hi guys, I'm a developer at Capital One, uh, as uh, was just introduced, and I wanted to talk to you about one of our open source projects, and it's called Cloud Custodian. And what is it? It is a rules engine for managing your accounts. Um, and it was born of the need that we had lots of things that we needed to manage, and the natural inclination for that would be to write a, a bunch of random one-off scripts, use the API, got lots of developers, and then if you extrapolate from that, though, and you exp expand on time and the enterprise and lots of rules and lots of things you want to do, you end up with this bad, in this bad place of having hundreds of random scripts deployed across your accounts um, and not actually having any real visibility into what's happening. So instead, we took a step back and said, well, we have lots of different things. What if we could, could extrapolate some of the commonalities and ensure that we had consistent reporting, consistent software development, consistent metrics and outputs? Um, such that we can have a single place to get visibility onto what's happening to an account. No more, I launched a server and something killed it randomly, what happened? More of a, here's a single file, here's what's gonna be governed in this account, sort of perspective. Um, so it's born of the enterprise, and I have this thing about enterprise software where it just, just generally like has a bad reputation and bad semantic connotations to it. Um, and Custodian tries to be different. It tries to be simple. Uh, it tries to be stateless. It's, it's one line install, and it, but it also scales out to solving enterprise problems and needs. Okay, so the hardest part as you bring lots of developers into a cloud uh, mentality coming in from you know, data centers or other environments that is, is just teaching them all the right things they should be doing. Um, and so Custodian tries to automate this that as users are doing things wrong, say they try to create an instance that's on the public internet with a wide open security group, that you actually say, shut that down, and then send them an email saying, hey, you did this wrong, here's the documentation on what you should be doing to be compliant to our policies. Um, and then driving, and so that helps drive compliance around encryption and backups, we use it for a lot of different things. We have, I think, 1,500 policies deployed across uh, Capital One right now. Um, we have a, uh, a lot of independent users on our open source community that are using it as well. Um, and then, of course, it helps us drive cost savings. So it keeps us secure and it helps save us money. Um, unlike other tools in the space, we're, we're, not, we're just don't, not trying to be a pretty picture. The enterprise has thousands of dashboards. Who needs another dashboard? What we need is actually the ability to drive real-time enforcement and behavior change. And so that's what, and you know, we output in CloudWatch metrics, so we can do a dashboard, but the real change is about driving that behavior change and driving enforcement capabilities. So what does it look like? It's basically a bunch of YAML files. Um, and it also has integrated in a serverless provisioning framework. Uh, it's not really meant to be general purpose. It was just when we wrote this last year, there wasn't really anything to fit to purpose, so we built our own. Um, and it's sort of embedded in the background uh, for, for provisioning any of these things in lambdas. Um, so it is YAML DSLs, and I'll go through some of the syntax here. Um, and then we have outputs that are consistent across any type of policy into S3, into CloudWatch logs, and into CloudWatch metrics. Um, and of course, you can take, go things across accounts. So sort of diving into what a policy actually is, it's a resource. Uh, every policy targets a particular resource type. Um, and then it's a set of filters. So find what you want. So I want to find all the EC2 instances that are using this key, that are in this VPC. And you can basically, you have a very rich set of filters, including some generic filters, like this value one, which uses the JMS path expressions that are built into the CLI. Um, or you have res uh, resource-specific filters, uh, like um, uh, an auto scale group having an invalid launch config, let's say. Uh, and so there are quite literally hundreds of filters and hundreds of actions, um, and you can combine them sort of in generic, uh, in reusable ways. So I'm taking an, ac an action like stop, for an instance. You might use that for tag compliance. You might use that for off hours. You might use that for different purposes. Um, and so being able to, uh, to decompose these actions into reusable components is what gives custodian its flexibility and its power to be able to craft millions of different policies. Um, and you can also arbitrarily nest the filters, and nested ORs and AND blocks and all that stuff. Um, but the, the nutshell is query some resources, filter to find the set you want, and then take some actions on them. And you can also do sort of like multi-step workflow sort of things like um, 
you know, find all the instances that are tagged poorly, let's give them some grace for a day, let's, let's send them an email or something, and then let's go ahead and stop them like two days after that, and then kill them after that. Um, and so what that comes out to is sort of a semantic policy that's expressed via multiple custodian policies. Um, so the first one on the left will find things that are not that are missing one of the app env or owner tags um, and that we haven't already looked at before and we'll mark them to be stopped in one day um, that mode section uh, i'll go into in a little bit but it actually tells us to provision this into as a lambda function uh, periodic lambda and on the right hand side we have sort of the second policy uh, which comes in and says have we ha do we have anything that's been marked for stop by today's date? If so, then it matches this filter, and we double check that it's also still not tagged properly, and then we'll go ahead and stop it and mark it to be terminated in two more days. So you can sort of chain these things together for sort of fairly rich sort of policies. Um, and so I talked a little bit about, you know, we have a set of generic filters and a set of generic actions. Um, like some of our generic actions are like invoking other third-party lambdas. Um, some of our generic filters is the most interesting one is probably uh, the value filter because of the JMAS path expressions. If you don't know, if you haven't used it before, it's basically like XPath for JSON. Um, and then it's built into the CLI. And we've extended that, uh, added additional semantics on top of JMAS path to allow for sort of rich comparison and filtering, um, matching within a list or doing sitter math or doing regexes and age comparisons. Um, and so, uh, and even pulling values, for, you know, from out of URLs for integration with, you know, various backend systems like, say, a CMDB or something. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, uh, New York Serverless Conference was the hottest conference ever, um, quite literally. And I, so I like to say, how can we top that um, besides air conditioning? Uh, and so, you know, when we launched it, at, uh, we actually launched uh, this as an open source project in, in April at the Chicago Summit. And so right after at the serverless conference in New York was sort of, you know, right after we were, we were still pretty young. And we had like maybe eight or nine resources then and maybe 30 actions and 40 filters. And we've, you know, I don't know, 10 x ourselves, so to speak, as far as our capable capabilities and addressable set. We can hit everything from Kinesis Analytics, like actually writing a, a new resource support is like five lines of code. Um, and so we've been able to get, I think we've got the broadest coverage of any cap tool that's in the market space at the moment. So people often ask me, what can you do with Custodian? Um, what does it do? And I'm like, well, you know, it can do lots of things. Like if I quite literally took all the filters and actions and tried to do a combinatorial expansion, we'd be in like, the numbers are like in the millions. Um, I can at least talk about some of the things that we are doing with it. Um, but as far as what you can do with it, I think you're primarily limited by, it's just Lego bricks. So it's really what you're able to construct as a policy for yourself. Um, but these are some of the things that we do do with it uh, at Capital One. Uh, we do, you know, encryption and uh, mandatory encryption and basically imposing behaviors on top of the AWS APIs. Um, you know, standard backups, uh, garbage collection, turning things off at night on the weekends with custom schedules and what have you. So we're at the serverless conference. So I think it, it, it's, it's good to focus on some of the, our serverless capabilities. So we integrate, we'll provision into uh, in ourselves into Lambda, any policy, it's basically just the addition of this mode. Um, we support four different modes, or so the default mode if you're running on the command line without specifying a mode is just pull all the resources and take filters uh, and do your filters and actions on that. But if you, we can also provision into, um, into Lambda with, and hook up our event sources. And so we support th these three event sources. And then we additionally have some additional capabilities as far as um, provisioning Lambda specifically to an action like uh, attaching a, a Lambda to a, an S3 bucket for encryption purposes or things like that. Um, and in this case, uh, we've got a, uh, a, a policy that will uh, basically get executed every anytime someone tries to create a database <laughs> to verify that that database is neither publicly available on the internet or is not encrypted, in which case we go ahead and delete it. Um, and generally speaking, whenever we, <laughs> in the real world, whenever we actually do uh, anything that's destructive, we always send people an email beforehand uh, to let them know that what they did wrong, part of that driving behavior change. Um, so CloudWatch events, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it is, it is sort of the bee's knees of, of being able to, to 
impose additional semantic behaviors on top of the API. Um, it's basically, it has, it encompasses a couple different pieces of functionality, um, but the, 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 inter the fun one is the fact that it's basically replaying CloudTrail on a, a much different, on a much lower latency than CloudTrail delivering to S3. Um, it's on a P99 of like 90 seconds, and you basically subscribe to any API call that goes into CloudTrail to then impose behaviors, business real time, let's say, um, on top of them. And uh, so, you know, for any of these sort of, I've got some sort of sample ones on the right, but, uh, and also some additional event modes that, that CloudWatch events supports. But, you know, we can take anything like launching an instance and then impose these additional semantic behaviors that we want as an enterprise to be able to enforce uh, on our resources. So another execution mode is sort of the, uh, the polling and the periodic, which are, are basically different modes for us if, uh, on a policy level are effectively the same thing. Um, poll is basically what we do to commonly on the client side uh, when we're just running a policy that it doesn't, isn't provisioning itself in the Lambda. Um, the key thing with poll is that we're actually able to use it as a cache. So we might execute you know, 500 policies on about EC2. And we're only gonna query the EC2 instances once for all those policies and we're just gonna run through the rest from the cache. Um, and so that gives us much greater uh, efficiency than some of the uh, other tools that I've, we've used. Um, and then periodic is, is just sort of a way to provision a Lambda and a cron job. I'm sure most of you have used it. We don't really recommend it for custodian usage um, just because we don't really, aren't really able to take advantage of a cache in that context. So we don't really use it, but it's there for sort of small accounts. I just wanna do something simple for off hours. Um, if you have like 30 instances, then maybe that, that's viable. Um, but we're, we're generally very sensitive to things that are uh, doing lots of API calls uh, without, without being, we're generally very sensitive to efficiency on our API usage. Um, a third one, which we added a few months ago, is, uh, is config role support. So Amazon has this sort of config service. Um, it tries to play in the compliance space. Um, it's typically, it's geared more as a reporting tool and it only supports like, I don't know, 15 or 20 resources. Um, and uh, we, we actually looked at, I looked at it initially as, you know, should we just do all of custodian on top of config roles? And, I, it just it didn't have the API coverage. Like, you know, we're using lots of Amazon services and we needed wide coverage space. So instead we went with cloud, the CloudWatch events, which proved to be a, a, much, a be much better use of time. But we came back to it because Config Role does have some interesting properties. It's integrated in the console, um, it has a sort of a versioned graph database history of your, the state of the resources that it does track. Um, and we basically give you the easiest way to provision a custom config role. Um, basically, if you add the, that mode type config role on a supported, on a config role, on a config supported resource type, it'll just provision itself as a config role. I've got one here deployed on the right hand side for a security group, and these are some of the resources that were marked as non compliant. And you can specify whether or not the filters are matching compliant resources or non compliant resources. Uh, so it's fairly flexible. And additionally, um, we still retain all of our capabilities as far as re remediation. So you can actually have this config role that can mark, you know, give you that, that uh, marker of compliance, non-compliance in the version graph, shows up in the console, but can also take the remediation action and notification actions to actually bring your account to compliance. So development. Um, I, I talked about sort of the random script stuff, um, and, and one of the challenges with that, with the random script stuff, was like software engineering. Like, where is it deployed? Like, you know, does it have unit tests? Was it code reviewed? All that stuff. Um, and so, of course, that means that we we had to do the same with Custodian, um, where we currently are on open source GitHub, Capital One slash Cloud Custodian. Uh, we're trending about 85 uh, percent unit test coverage, 350 unit tests. Uh, we do continuous integration, all the good stuff. Um, and then, you know, as far as our internal, how we do deployment, we have a set of Canary accounts. Uh, if that works out cleanly, then we switch out, post that to dev, and then we do uh, our prod deployments um, as far as our accounts. But effectively, for all of our accounts, we treat everything as prod. Um, and then config side, I mean, these are, this is a tool of, when you have account fleet level management tools, they are sort of tools of, of, of mass destruction, so to speak. Um, and so being able to, treat them with care and caution as far as the config policies that are being run uh, and, and being utilized is really important. So internally, we, we validate any policy with JSON uh, schema. And so uh, we typically set up 
as a, uh, with GitHub native workflows, where every, each account gets a separate configuration uh, repo, and as people submit pull requests to that, we'll run our CI and, and our CD. And our CI is basically using Drone to do this JSON schema validation, um, and then we'll actually do dry run. One of the, the nice things is that you can take any policy and see, just use, you know, add a dry run command line option, and it'll actually do all the filters without taking any of the action. So you can see what it would actually, what resources it'll actually match. Um, and then for, for uh, you know, production and multi-person sign-offs, we use a tool called LGTM. Looks good to me. So, what do you have to do uh, to install this? Uh, now there's, there's a Docker run equivalent, but this is, you can also just do pip install C7N, and that's it. Uh, there's no database to set up, there's no web server, it's, it's you know, fairly stateless. Um, and uh, if you wanna run a policy, you just you know, write, it, you write some YAML in, in, a, in a file and you just run it and you're done. Um, and you can also do Docker run, there's a lot of built-in command line help. And looking at some of the options, uh, you can do CloudWatch metrics with dash M um, and log groups, uh, you can do cross count stuff with the sim role. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And then uh, that output directory S can go into S3 uh, as well, which is recommended. So let's switch out to looking at some sample policies. Like what is it we can actually do with this stuff? Oh, oh I didn't actually put the right policy there. Okay. Anyways, uh, there's actually a sample in our docs um, of, of doing the, the off hour stuff. So. Uh, ignore this uh, policy. Um, th this one we'll, we'll talk about in a second. But you can save a lot of money just by turning off your instances at night, like, or just doing it on the weekends. Um, you can, we support both doing that for EC2 instances and autoscale groups, um, and our docs have examples for that. So another one that, <laughs> the right example, um, is just sort of understanding like who made something. You know, not everyone, CloudTrail doesn't necessarily, and the console doesn't necessarily have history. Not everyone has access to necessarily the indexes that you may have on CloudTrail. Um, so, you know, sometimes it's just easiest to stick a tag on it of who created it. Um, and doing that automatically in case people forgot about it. So, you can, this is one that for S3 will automatically tag the resource with who created, which user in the, in created it. It knows how to parse SSO and other forms of uh, IAM identity management. Um, and you can do that on EC2 and Oscale groups, uh, sorry, EC2 and, and S3 and uh, RDS and Redshift and other things. So, huh. uh, yeah, so, you know, figuring out where you're spending your costs, like databases can be quite costly, like Redshift databases, RDS databases. And by definition, if these things have zero connections over two weeks, um, they're not being used, so we can garbage collect them. Or an ELB with no instances is attached. It's just sort of, garbage that's been left around and maybe forgotten about. Um, and so uh, custodian integrates CloudWatch metrics support. We, any, any resource that supports CloudWatch metrics, you can use as a filter to find out the resources that you're interested in. Um, and so pretty much every CloudWatch metric out there is something that you can use as a filter uh, for finding the resources you want. In this case, we're looking at all databases that are older than two weeks that have had zero connections for the last two weeks. So by definition, that database is not used. And then we go ahead and, and initiate this sort of one of those multi-step workflows for cleaning it up and deleting it. Uh, and then at the bottom left, there's some other resources that I'd recommend doing cleanups with as well. Uh, some people, uh, especially coming from the data center mindset, you, there's this mindset of, I need to pre-allocate the biggest thing I can possibly get, because I'll never get a chance to get it again. Um, and so they, they get like these M4 10X larges, and I'm like, you know, it's cloud guys, just use what, you know, you know, scale on demand, it's, it's utilization, you can get capacity as you need it. Um, but, you know, people are learning still. So uh, here's a policy that'll actually just resize an instance for you. Um, in this case, we're looking for particular, two particular instance types and that they're older than a certain amount of time and that they're not really utilized very well. And then we're gonna go ahead and resize them, including during the restart. Um, and then we're just doing a map of the resources, from one resource type to another. Um, uh, we do, so uh, there's some caveats here. We have to restart an instance to resize it. Um, you can't necessarily resize all the way down because uh, things like EBS optimization, if you, you can't, you can't, if you have it, you can't drop, you can't lose it um, as far as what instance types we support. So we kind of just pass that to the user and say, give us, tell us what you want to do explicitly um, as far as mapping one resize to another. Uh, we do, 
we do this sort of this, some of the stuff. We do some more involved things as far as workflows for, for resources like um, encrypting an instance. Like it's like a eight or nine step process, and we just have an action to automate it for people. Like you have to like stop the instance and snapshot the volumes, and then take a created encrypted snapshot from that and create a volume from that, and then patch the instances. And or you can just say encrypt instance, and it'll do it for you. Um, anyways, moving on. So. Uh, some, you know, I also like to think of Custodian as sort of like the Swiss Army knife of AWS. Like, you know, there's a lot of sort of things you want to ask sometimes that are potentially difficult. Like, you want to, like AWS, uh, you know, a lot of the services, they're, they're great services, but the cross connections because of how internally, you know, Conway's Law, they themselves are very federated as an organization, so all these services tend to operate fairly independently of each other. And so if you want to cross the service boundaries um, to get answers to questions, it tends, it can be difficult. And so, um, having a tool that can do that for you uh, gives you a very flexible query capability against your infrastructure. Um, so in this particular case, uh, you know, there, uh, we want to make sure that any ELB, ELB that's pointing directly to the internet has instances that have no roles on it. Um, you know, we don't want, we want to make sure, we want to go at least one hop before people get access to the APIs, um, let's say. This is a contrived example. Um, and so this will actually just look at, find all the ELBs that are out there that are facing the internet and then query the instances, uh, find the instances uh, that are attached to those ELBs that have uh, any instance, uh, and ha have an, an IAM profile uh, such that we can say, well, we're not supposed to do that. Um, and so you can run this interactively as a query. Um, one of the nice things with the cache on the local command line client is that it basically pulls down those, query, those resources once and thereafter you can basically go interactive on adding and adapting your filters to get to a, a more uh, fine-grained set. Um, here's another one just sort of on doing security groups of just saying, you know, which of my security groups is, allows ports in addition to these given ports. Um, this as an example. And CloudTrail. So, you know, CloudTrail is really good and people set up, typically set up CloudTrail, but they don't necessarily set it up with KMS. Um, so we also support this notion of a pseudo resource called an account resource. We do things like service limits on it um, and various other things that are, are, are useful. Um, being able to do, you know, make sure that cloud config is enabled, make sure that CloudTrail is enabled, um, being able to set up, you know, notifications, hey, you're about to get to 80% of your, you know, instances that, uh, available in this region uh, and get a note on that, get an alert on that as opposed to, hitting it in production and realizing that you couldn't scale to handle an event. Um, this is more on the sort of the encryption side. Uh, we have this you know, filter for non-encrypted, which will actually scan the ASG and its launch config and all the snapshots and AMIs associated um, to, to figure out uh, if uh, it, it, it is not encrypted. Um, and then you know, we can take some actions like delete and notify and what have you. Uh, and we can do that for ASGs, Redshift, RDS, pretty much anything out there. Um, you can even do some things like transport level security on, on Redshift and RDS by scanning the parameter groups, uh, all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, S3 is called Simple Storage Service. I don't think it's simple. It's got a lot of subtlety, so, but it's very scalable, so I think they should rename that. Um, so in this one on S3, we're just gonna slap down encryption policies as you create buckets, and then we'll automatically detect if that's bucket is a log target and then flip out from an encryption policy because AWS doesn't store logs encrypted um, like for ELB or S3 logs and we'll instead attach a Lambda encrypt function uh, to that bucket. Um, but this is a pet peeve of mine. I've done a lot of talk about encryption because I've been dealing with it a lot. Um, encryption at rest is, you know, what does that threat model actually mean? It, it means someone like breaking into Amazon's data center, yanking hard drives, mapping it back to a customer. It's like winning the lottery, like multiple times. Um, access control in the public cloud, like that is your number one concern, bar none. Um, you know, that is uh, a lot of these resources. You know, they're public endpoints. They are part of your network perimeter, and so making sure that the policies on those things are are safeguarded is hugely important. Um, and so a lot of resources actually have the capability of attaching IAM policies to them. And so 
doing validation on those IAM policies that are attached to resources, like S3 buckets, like SNS, like ECR, like SQS, like Lambda functions, like KMS keys, is really important. Uh, and so this will actually, uh, these policies on the right will actually parse your IAM policies attached to a resource, and then you give it a whitelist of accounts that you think are good, and it'll make sure that, it's, that the access is not be given, being given outside of that set of accounts. Um, another one, just for like quality of service things, um, is uh, autoscale groups. So autoscale groups will tend to go spinning. Uh, they, they weakly reference the resources. Launch configs do not strongly reference resources. Like if you try to, to delete a snapshot associated with an AMI, AWS will say, no, nope, can't do that, because um, it's strongly referenced. An autoscale group, you could, anything that's in a launch config is basically weakly referenced. And so you can kill the key pair, the security group, the subnet, the, the AMI, the, the anything. And the autoscale group will be like, okay. And it'll just continually try to launch instances. And so you get this spinning launch uh, autoscale group behavior. So we have a little filter that will go check all that stuff for you. Um, and then after that, you can you know, delete it, you can send an email out, you can resize your ASG uh, to stop that. And that's mostly about quality of service. Um, and just, you know, we're, we try to be cautious about uh, main, ensuring that accounts don't, uh, are, are well managed from a API rate limit perspective. So, if any of this sounds interesting, we're hiring. Um, <laughs> and come see us at the booth. Uh, we've got a lot of great people here from our UK office as well as our US groups. And uh, so, as far as the roadmap on, on the short term, uh, our documentation, we, we've, we've focused on features over docs. So, we're going to tr try to shoot for 1.0 reInvent this year. And uh, we'll be talking there. Uh, I think we have two, two presentations. I just opened up a, an encore on Friday. And um, beyond that, sort of short-term stuff is, is doing some of the lock diff uh, stuff around sort of the network and IAM backbone around the accounts, just leveraging config to be able to, to prevent all unauthorized changes. Uh, additional network support. I started sort of going from a security group and filtering out uh, you know, what ports were available. But you actually, you want to go uh, from a resource, and we have some basic support for looking at from a resource saying, you know, what ports can I get to, or, or, make, or what EC2 instances are accessible on, you know, port, you know, 55, 99. Um, being able to do that sort of thing uh, is also important. So we're adding additional network support. Um, we're poking around additional cloud providers. It's probably longer term. I'm thinking, like, mm, probably next year. Uh, but it, which is not that far away, um, but definitely interested in that. Um, we also have a bunch of stuff that we already have built out that um, I need to get cleaned up and get into our open source release. Um, currently, our, our outbound notification implementation is based on SQ, is a Lambda that just sits in, and pulls on SQS. Uh, we, uh, it's currently got some LDAP goo in it that we need to clean up and push out. Um, we've also been uh, doing SQLite, <laughs> SQLite cloud trail analytics, so just for rate limit analysis, so just daily SQLite dumps. Um, it's, it's been really actually quite useful. Uh, scale out S3 scanning. Um, for production operations, we actually, this is, oh, this is interesting. So um, we actually parse our CloudWatch logs and analyze we, with a simple filter and then analyze uh, tracebacks in our, from our code. And then we'll parse those out and send them to a system called Sentry. We, we initially did like, error subscriptions and emails, but it just wasn't very scalable or useful. Um, Sentry is a great open source product for doing sort of error aggregation and uh, helping us do triage lists um, across accounts and our software. And so that's been great. So a wish list for Lambda. Um, so we've, Lambda's been great. Um, we, we've had a few pain points. Uh, this, I think I was talking to some of the, the other Lambda uh, users at serverless conf, so there's quite a few of them here. Uh, about what some of the pain points are. Um, the audit trail in Lambda in CloudTrail is kind of broken. Um, the only, the only non-impersonatable thing of, about it is the role. Um, it would be nice if we could actually get the, the function ARN into that uh, to actually be able to uniquely identify where these, who's doing this API call and which Lambda is it. Um, they only do environment variables, sort of like bound variables, like as you deploy. Uh, will allow us to reuse Lambda's functions that are effectively the same, just, just minus parameters, uh, a lot more easily. Um, getting a detailed billing breakout, which might have a prerequisite of tagging, like these are all sort of 
this is all sort of platform stuff we need to be able to, to build out the next gen, to, the, to continue our journey down the serverless world. Uh, and then, of course, better error reporting. Um, you know, just better introspection capabilities about the runtime in general will be great. Um, like, you know, figuring out something as a timeout versus an actual error or why something timed out um, can be a little bit challenging. Uh, and then, of course, we just we have a new logo. We have T-shirts. Um, I hadn't realized until I saw the black and white how 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 much it looks like a, a certain robot um, thing. Uh, <laughs> but it, it was meant to be more of a shield motif. Um, but yeah, we're open source on, on and we have there's our Gitter uh, link for if you want to come chat with us. We're available. Um, and uh, our developer website at Capital One has this and our other projects as well. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, we actually build tools to do, or sorry, buy tools to do this sort of thing, but for business rules rather than managing AWS. Have you ever thought of using this as a rules engine more generally? Um, no. <laughs> uh, very, very much focused on sort of the cloud management space in this context, um, and you know there are also third-party tools in, in that space as well. Um, and so, uh, really, just expanding our capability set, um, we've been able to use it at significant scale and can show that it's very competitive um, with other products out there. Uh, but as far as more general space, you know. People want to use JBVM or Jules or some other engine. We're not going to play in that space. 